When you step on your car's accelerator, your car takes off. And the same is true for a business accelerator. Today, we're gonna to be digging into what an accelerator is and how it helps a business go from zero to 100 fast. So stay tuned. Everybody, this is Chris Brandt here with Sundish Patel. Welcome to another future podcast. Today, we're talking with Molly Dill, who is a managing director at Generator. Generator is a venture capital firm and accelerator that brings together startup founders, investors, corporations, job seekers, universities, musicians, and artists. Generator also believes that everyone deserves opportunity, regardless of race, place, or gender. So let's talk with Molly about Generator, about what an accelerator does and how they can help businesses succeed. And let's see if we can get some tips from Molly about what makes a business successful. Welcome, Molly. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited to have you. This is a cool conversation because, you know, we talk a lot about uh, VC and things like that. Um, but, you know, we don't really talk about sort of the nuances between accelerators and VCs and incubators and all that. Um, so I'm really excited to you know dig into that. But before we get into that, could you just tell me a little bit about Generator and how everything got started? And, and you know, what what sort of uh, what was the passion that drove the creation of Generator? So Generator got started in 2012. Our co-founders, Joe Kurgis and Troy Vossler, um, started it here in Wisconsin, where we're based. And originally, we just had one startup accelerator. Um, we just had the um, Milwaukee and Madison investment accelerators. We would switch back and forth between those. And that's where we invest in the startup companies coming through the program. Um, now, we've expanded to more than 50 cities with our programming, and we've added pre-accelerator programs, upskilling programs for people who want to be in new careers. We have programs for artists and musicians who want to um, take their career to the next level. And we kind of treat them like entrepreneurs in that program. And we just have all sorts of different things that we're doing. We have a corporate innovation program for corporate innovation executives, kind of like a tra uh, industry trade association for them. Um, so in 2012, we just had one little startup accelerator. We brought five startups through per year. And now uh, we have impact across the U.S. and in Europe. You've kind of started off as this sort of investment group, and then you kind of expanded into so many areas. I mean, like, you know, I love the the bit about, you know, you're, you're helping artists and get get there as well. I mean, that's, um, you know, like, what, what was sort of behind the thinking of, like, expanding in that direction? Speaking of a half of, <laughs> of our leadership, I mean, I wasn't here when they decided to do that, but my understanding is... You know, we saw the potential for communities to invest into their best and brightest, and we could do that beyond just the startup space. And that looking at the careers of musicians and artists, for example, we saw how we could look at them in the same way as an entrepreneur, provide them grant funding, introduce them to music labels or galleries, and really help them take their art career to the next level by making the same type of connections we make for startups. So in the startup world, we're connecting them with venture capitalists or mentors, um, similar thing. We interviewed a company maybe we should talk to you about later, uh, Canvas, that uh, does, uh, they're, they, they're sort of a, a, a mapping application to find street murals and, and art like that with all the information about the artists and stuff like that, and they're pre-seed. So yeah, we talk about uh, venture capital, incubators, accelerators, and I think in a lot of people's heads, that all kind of gets mixed together into one bucket. But I mean, really different kinds of uh, companies approaching the, the the challenge of, you know, making a business successful from different angles. Can you talk about what the difference is? I think that's kind of a common uh, point of confusion. And so um, it's because that uh, all of these types of organizations are offering programming and assistance to entrepreneurs. But I would say the main difference is uh, incubators are usually a real estate play. So it's mm. shared space. Uh, with other startups sort of using uh, like, you know, splitting the cost of overhead, um, kind of work co-working together, and then maybe having some programming and resources available. Right. An accelerator program is a much more um, specific like journey in time. It's it's a program, <laughs> there's curriculum to it. It's a, It's got a start and an end point, and it's usually pretty intensive. The startups that come through the generator program, it's 12 weeks of working with us one-on-one, -on -one, um, us introducing them to like 90 mentors, 
50 plus investors during the program and really um, working hard on building additional traction in sort of a nine week sprint. First of all, that's hugely helpful. I have to imagine as, you know, an entrepreneur and a startup, um, you know, getting all those kinds of resources and that kind of expertise brought in to, you know, kind of basically train you. Um, How many companies do you do at a time? How many can you support at least? Each generator program can only accept five to six startups per cohort. So that's kind of differentiates us from other startup accelerators as we really like to keep it small so that we can provide concierge assistance with whatever a startup needs to grow faster. Um, So the cohort size is very small, which helps build additional camaraderie among the startups in the cohort as well, but it allows us to really hone in, jump in on projects with them. Um, So that's happening in each of our markets is five at a time. And, And so how many cohorts do you do a year? Personally, I do one per year. Um, but okay. Generator has programming running all over the country all the time. We're in more than 50 cities. So I would say wow. at least 50 programs are happening per year, but I'm not 100% sure on the actual total at this point. <laughs> That's actually quite a bit. I mean, if, if you think about it. And then, and then you're also, I mean, you also operate as part of it is being a, a venture capital group as well, right? Yeah, we are technically a venture capital fund. To this point, we've only invested in conjunction with our startup accelerator programs, but mm-hmm. we are now sort of starting to expand into Um, raising funds that we might be able to um, invest follow-on capital into the companies coming through our programs that um, is less tied to the program itself. Where you're at, you generally come in as like a a seed round or pre-seed round. Is that correct? And then, so this new fund would would get you into like more like an angel round or like where would you, where would that kind of fit in? Exactly. So it'd be whatever, you know, the follow-on round beyond um, the the seed round or wherever the, the startup came into our program. Sometimes we have Series A, so then it would be their Series B or whatever it might be. A lot of people get confused about the, the kind of difference between, you know, like the angel rounds, Series A, Series B, you know, like what does all that mean uh, to people? It is a little bit of semantics. Everyone defines it a bit differently, <laughs> but usually the order is, um, you know, friends and family, angels, then um, Series A, Series B, et cetera. I've seen all the way through Series E. You just never know. <laughs> Generally, um, you're starting first with the investors who have, you know, individuals who have a little extra capital and that um, would like to put that into your company and sort of take the biggest risk. Um, the reason they call them angels <laughs> is because they take the biggest risk. They, they often right. lose their money. So accredited investors... Uh, have, I believe, a million or more in uh, liquid assets. Um, so that's where the the angel and then the v, uh, angels come in as in credit investors. And then VCs are usually part of a venture capital firm, uh, which raises a fund and then redeploys that into startups like we do. As you mentioned, like getting in at sort of that seed round, angel round is, you know, higher risk, but on the other side of that is potentially a higher reward. Why Why was that area of the whole system like where you guys wanted to fit in? So I guess it's because we're, we're a company. So angels are usually <laughs> individuals. So for right. Generator, you know, we wanted to um, raise a fund and then um, deploy that into startup companies that we think have really high potential. So we're doing a lot of work on the due diligence side on behalf of our limited partners in the fund to make sure that we're really vetting all of the startups, um, looking under every rock in the country to find the very best startups in the country, and then bringing them through the accelerator program to help them have the best chance of success. And then ultimately, the goal is for them to close a larger round of venture capital funding coming out of our program. As opposed to being an angel investor, an accredited investor, just putting money into a company, what you're doing is you're actually setting the company up for success while investing that money. So you're taking a little bit of that, you're hedging your risk a little bit by educating the company and giving them the support they need to, to grow, right? That's the goal, yeah. And so it is, uh, we invest 100,000 into each of the five companies per cohort, but it's so much more than that with all the value we provide with like opening our network to them, helping them find members, um, introducing them to investors. And then um, we actually do a lot of preparation around um, their pitch and making sure they're communicating effectively to those investors as well. When you're looking at these companies, you say you do a lot of due diligence on them. What is it? What are the kinds of things that you're looking at? Usually, the the four main areas that we're really looking at most closely for startups that apply for an interview for our programs are um, team, product, traction, and opportunity. So, you know, is the team well rounded? Are they experts in the space? 
Um, the product, is it highly unique and highly scalable? Um, the opportunity, so what is the market size and is it sort of in that venture backable range, you know, high hundreds of millions to low billions? Lastly, the traction, which really is the most important piece, is any sort of demonstration of demand. So whether that be revenue or if the company is pre-revenue, do they have like a wait list that's growing or users on their uh, app that continue to grow every month? So just showing us there's proven and increasing demand is a big part of that. Um, but then in the due diligence process, you know, we do bring in our legal counsel to do some more in-depth um, analysis of, you know, the company's financials, their cap table, um, all sorts of other documentation we ask them to provide us to make sure that it's um, an investment we're comfortable moving forward with. Uh, I'm curious, you you described the four different areas that you guys look at. Where does the people part of that equation, how important is that to your firm and how you guys go about it? Uh, it seems to be from, at least from the, the enterprise tech side that Chris and I, you know, are, are frequently watching, the people are a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so like, how, how do you guys measure the the actual people behind the idea. Yeah. And you hear VCs saying that a lot as like they're investing in the people for first and foremost. Right. So it's very important to us to, um, we're looking at, is it a solo founder or have they been able to build a team around themselves and convince others to work with them that have a complementary skill set? Um, it's hard to build a startup as a solo founder. I mean, it's hard for one person to be completely well-rounded and have all the skills that are needed um, so we really like to see more than one founder. We also are assessing throughout the process. So they submit an application and then we do three rounds of interviews to choose the cohort. And we're assessing throughout that time, how do they interact with us and others? How do they interact with their co-founders? You know, um, do we see ourselves being able to work with them for maybe 10 years until the we exit the investment? Um I mean, it's a long-term relationship. It's like getting married. So you want to make sure that it's a founder you're comfortable continuing to, to work with because we have the 12-week program, but then we provide alumni support forever after the program. So we're checking in with them at least on a monthly basis. You've come across, a obviously, a lot of companies through this process. What What is it that makes a company successful? Like, what are the core skills that you teach companies to to really be, to succeed in the market? So I think there's a lot of different things that it takes to be successful. And so I'll try to generalize this a little bit, but like I know, some of the things I say ask. most frequently to startups coming through our program, aside from helping them just communicate what their company specifically does more clearly is, um, you know, really like as you're first getting started, make sure you become an absolute expert in your industry space. You always have competitors, whether that's people doing nothing or the status quo um, but try to do your very best to find out who your competitors are, either indirect or direct competitors, and then learn everything you can about them. So maybe if you're a SaaS platform, sign up to do a demo, pretend you're a customer, and just really learn the ins and outs of how they pitch their product, and then make sure that you're filling a different niche and that you're positioning yourself to be the, the market leader based on that information. So really becoming an expert in the space will help you identify what your competitive moat is, and um, just really keep you in the loop with what's happening and and uh, what you should be keeping up with. I talk to uh, companies all the time and I have that conversation. So like, so who are your competitors in this space? <laughs> oh, we don't have any competitors. <laughs> and I'm, I'm always suspicious of that answer, right? Because I just don't feel like, and in, especially when I know some of the competitors, you know? Definitely. And if as an investor brings up a competitor you've never heard of in, in a Q&A session, that's, not a good sign. Um, so it's really important that you're aware of competitors and you have like a response when an investor asks you, well, aren't you just like this or that? Another thing that's really important is really sit with your customers. Um, so you need to know from the very start, even before your product is built, who are you building this for and what problem are you solving um, to better understand how you can build out the features that are most important. Who's ultimately going to pay for it, right? Like right. you need to build the features people want or they won't pay you for it. So um, really sitting with your customers, asking for feedback early and often from them, um, and just better understanding what they're willing to pay for to demonstrate that early demand. We see a lot of companies too that that um, they 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 have this great idea and they they build this product, and then they sit down with customers, and then we see the big pivot. 
(laughs) (laughs) So if you don't want to have to do that first pivot, not that there won't be more pivots down the road, but uh, yeah, I think that's a really, really big point for sure. Well, that's the thing is it's hard to show someone a half finished product. You feel like you can't be proud of it because it's not quite what you want it to be, but you have to do that. Or if you sit there tinkering and perfecting for two years and then no one wants it, that's going to be really disappointing and expensive. You get in your head as a business owner and as an engineer, you know, what what you think people really want. And it's so often you make assumptions and, and, and think about things that just, you know, aren't what the market really wants. But on the other hand, there's a certain part of innovation that demands looking beyond what's out there today and what the market needs today and look towards what the market needs in the future. So I, I got to imagine that's a little bit of a tricky balance. You got to first get them on the hook. You get a customer on something. And then after that, you got to really sell them on the vision, right? There's There's got to be a little outcome. There has to be a value proposition in your MVP that says, we do this, we do it really well. But then it's about, here's where we are going and here's where we want to be three to five years from now. I feel like that's a big part of the uh, the early on selling. It's like painting that vision and like where you eventually plan to be, um, but, sh- you know, giving them like the very basic version of that and and keeping them on the line until the, f- the full perfect version is is available. Yeah, I almost want to second what Sundish was saying there, because I do think that, um, you know, there's oftentimes a new technology comes to market and it's not maybe as good, you know, it's going to be this revolutionary new technology, but may not be as as good or as complete at that moment as some of the the, the you know, historic competitors in that space. And a company really needs to do a good job of saying, here's where we are, where we are today, but here's where we're going tomorrow. And mm-hmm. if you believe in that, come with us on that journey, and then you can be part of helping shape this product, right? 100%. Yep. For so many of these companies, it's that that sort of messaging piece, that marketing, initial marketing piece that's that's uh, really tricky to them. And the thing is, is that it's so important because getting those early sales can really change a custom, company's valuation, right? Sales are hard. Um, and the, the best way to get sales and the best way to set your pricing is to go out there and try it and experiment um, and see what people come back with and what people will pay you for it. Um, so, you know, obviously benchmarking against, um, your competitors on the pricing. So it's not way out of left field, but, um, really going out there and saying, would you pay $10 for this? Right. Um, <laughs> and just like kind of, you're kind of making it up as you go and seeing what happens. But, um, you have to really first prove that you can sell. That's a very first step. Just sell to one person and then from there sell reliably and then sell at scale, and then last of all, sell at margin. So I think that's something that entrepreneurs sometimes put the cart before the horse on margin and think, well, this might not be profitable, blah, blah, blah. Just prove you can sell it. Um, If you prove you can sell it, and then you can set in place a repeatable sales process, that's going to help so much down the road. And then later, you can worry about profit. Molly, you said something earlier that one of the things that you look for is multiple founders in the beginning of a organization. And I think that that it needs to be double clicked on too, because what I see often is a founder who, you know, to be a founder or an entrepreneur, you got to have some level of confidence and audacity to even try to build something, right? But sometimes yeah, that definitely. ego is just so overpowering <laughs> that that one person at the top, the founder, the CEO, whatever it might be, there's so much control and ego in that, that 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 doesn't matter what feedback they get from everybody else they're just going to be committed to what their vision is and what they feel it is and not bring people into the circle. And that's when you you see those things happen. They're not listening to the customer. They're just convinced that everybody else is wrong. And their baby, which it is their baby, is, you know, is way more valued than what customers think it is. And that works for Steve Jobs, but for most everybody else, <laughs> not so much. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, it depends on the founder and their sort of personality profile, but there's, you definitely start to see some founder personality types and the the strong headed one is, is a founder personality I've worked with on several occasions. And you kind of find yourself butting heads throughout the program. Like, please, can you try something different? Um, and eventually we we get through to them. We usually get through to them. They try something different. It works. They're amazed. 
uh, and we have a really happy ending. Um, so yeah, it's it sometimes takes some convincing. We've seen the founder syndrome a lot. It's not just, I mean, you know, and and it's and it's true for many levels of the company too. The person who's great for the startup version of that company is not necessarily the same person who's great for the mature version of that company, exactly. right? And knowing when those inflection points happen is really important for a company to understand. Yep. We've definitely had companies that um, have moved on to a different, you know, brought on a new CEO um, and gone back to, stayed at the company, but gone back to their original passion, which was the R&D that led to the creation yeah. of the company or moved on to their next venture because they've been working on it, you know, working their fingers to the bone. They're ready to try something else. Um, we've had founders, you know, wanting to sell um, who are just kind of ready to be done. You know, there's all types yeah. of different ways that um, the startup journey kind of comes to an end for the the original founder and CEO. And um, I think there's a lot of valid pathways there. You know, when a company grows, you know, a lot of times individual contributors find themselves suddenly managers. and you know, management is a very different skill set than individual contributor. And, you know, you have to be able to, you know, find a career path for all these people uh, to keep them involved. But sometimes it's just not the right fit. People who are who like startups need to go and be with startups. Scaling is tough at any company. And I think, you know, culture is an important thing to think about as you're scaling. And like, what do we want our culture to be? Uh, making sure you're not ignoring that element of building a business because it is important. So culture is something that Chris and I talk about a lot. It's in our tagline. What do you see from a culture perspective um, in these earlier stage companies that's been extremely successful? And then also, it's the second part of it is we've talked a lot about how great um, I mean, how, how to make great companies and what it takes to be successful. But have you also learned about what are like, what is like one of the warning signs that this company <laughs> won't be successful? One really interesting one, uh, there's a company in our portfolio called Fiveable that is an education technology platform. Um, they were just perfectly positioned when COVID started and everything went virtual. It allows students to, um, you know, study together outside of class. Um, and they've raised more than $10 million with the help of Serena Williams and Chelsea Clinton, just like a really cool success story. But their culture has been really interesting. So they moved here to Milwaukee for our generator program, and they ended up staying, which is a great success story for Milwaukee. Um, and they actually have like a founder house, like they all live together and work together. Um, so I mm -hmm. thought that was a really interesting approach. I don't know if it would work for everyone, but it's really, obviously, they have great communication um, and I've seen that on the show Silicon Valley. Yeah, how that worked out <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so they, you know, obviously it, it it works well for them, um, and I think they've they're obviously a very close team for that reason. That's built a really strong culture for them. What are the warnings to the to the disastrous ones? You know, if the if the cap table is really complicated, um, so the capitalization table, like how many investors you have and and what percentage they own of the company. If the founder doesn't own a significant percentage of the company or the CEO doesn't have, you know, some skin in the game there, that's a bit of a red flag. We can always work with people to get that adjusted. But like if the founder doesn't have like a vested interest, um, that's that can be a red flag. Being a solo founder or showing that you're not open to feedback or you're really strong headed and sort of steamroll the conversation can be a red flag if the founder personality is so strong that they're not going to be able to take feedback from us and apply that to the business. You mentioned uh, Fiveable, which sounds like a really interesting uh, and, and perfectly timed company. Um, you, you've got a really large portfolio. I mean, I you shared your portfolio with me the other day and I was looking through it. I'm like, wow, there's a lot in here. Um, could you mention just that, like a couple of ones that maybe you worked on or that you, you thought, wow, this was a really cool interaction with this company and they did really interesting stuff? Yeah, I would love to do some free promotion. Um, so <laughs> yeah. specifically in my, uh, I run the Generator Milwaukee and Generator Madison Investment Accelerators. Um, some of the companies I worked with, and this is hard because I'm like singling people out. I love them all. Yeah, I know. You're all, um, they're all your babies, right? <laughs> but yeah, I mean. Um, no, and I'll, I'll just do this. I'll, I'll say. She mentioned your company, but I had to edit it out for time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Ponto Footwear is a great one that's got a lot of traction. They have 
um, a shoe that's kind of a chameleon. So you can wear it to walk your dog or to attend a wedding. Um, it's made out of sustainable materials, top to bottom. Um, just a really fantastic company and, and a really driven uh, founder team. Another one is Trace, which is um, really the first of its kind. It, we we really loved this investment because it's a blue ocean. There's really nothing else competing with them, but it's a platform for transgender individuals to bring together their community and to form community with each other to create a safe space online to track their transition so they can track their voice changes, take pictures and videos to track how their appearance changes, um, you know, keep track of the injections that they're um, taking and all that. And it's a really nice way for them to document that journey and also have a safe place to share it online. Wow, the platform's cool. called Trace. Sustainagrain, which is creating a sustainable um, grain that's sort of a sister of wheat, um, that would be um, uh, it would be much better for the environment than traditional farming methods. Um, so it's a really uh, interesting and kind of nutty flavor, and they've been able to get that into several food and beverage companies, um, including in a beer. Uh, made by Dogfish Head, oh. and then in some like uh, cereals and things like that, but. Um, just a really interesting, um, sustainable company that they're building in Kansas. We really love investing in uh, startups in the middle of the country because we think innovation is happening everywhere. We, you know, we think a lot of founders are overlooked by investors on the coast. So uh, we really uh, yeah. focus on the middle of the country. Another aspect that's really interesting is you guys are bringing more equity to the to the game of you know, financing and things like that. Right. I mean, you, you know, obviously with trace, you know, there's, there's sort of a, a commitment to, you know, broader community there and just in terms of the companies you're investing in, but the, the people, people you're investing in too, it is kind of a mission for you guys as well. Correct. Yeah. We want to make sure that our portfolio really, um, matches the makeup of the U S and we publicly report on our statistics of the people who go through our cohorts, um, and we've called on other VCs to do the same. Um, there's not as much of that in the industry as there needs to be for us to turn things around, but like less than 1% of venture capital goes to black founders and it's just an, a major problem. So we've launched several accelerators now specifically for black and brown founders. Um, our Northwestern Mutual Black Founder Accelerator here in Milwaukee um, has been a really great success story. We, we've been able to track the statistics from that and show we've had a measurable impact on um Black VC investment nationwide just from our investments from that program. So it's been really, really cool to see. It's so important. And we think you can do well by doing good. And that's a huge part of our mission. We did a show on uh, B Corps at one time and, you know, talked about sort of that angle of it, which I, I think is really uh, cool. I like the idea of, you know, like a, co a public company that has a bigger commitment to the world in general than just sort of maximizing shareholder, shareholder value. value. Right? Yeah. yeah, we actually recently became a B Corp. That oh, was really? really exciting for us. From what I understand, a very rigorous process to go through, yes. but we are really excited to have recently achieved that designation. Um, again, that just fits in so well with our mission. So it was a foregone conclusion that we would go for that. Well, congratulations on that. I think Thank that you. I think more companies should should look into that and, and pursue that path. Me too. You know, you're investing in companies, a lot of companies. Uh, you're, you've built the whole program out. You know, now you're a B Corp. So what's next? Where do you go from here? Yeah, I mean, we continue to expand into new cities. So when we find um, partners that um, that want to bring us to their community, we, uh, we talk to them about how we might uh, make that happen. So uh, every time we expand into a new com community, we like to make sure we have a partner, whether that be a corporation, uh, university, uh, economic development corp, uh, organization, EDO, economic development organization <laughs> that um, can help us finance the overhead of offering the program, but also partner with us to reach the entrepreneurs in their community. So that's kind of how we um, plan our expansion efforts is where are we getting the most um, partner interest and uh, requests for us to come to their community. And then that we expand from there. So I expect we'll continue to inspect, expand in Europe as well, because we have one outpost there so far in Luxembourg, but I think we'll add more Europe programs. Um, but I can't say for sure which city will end up being next. <laughs> that's that's the NDA part of the conversation. <laughs> uh, what, what about Chicago? I, I know Milwaukee's awfully close. Yeah, but. we are in Chicago, actually. We have a sustainability accelerator in Chicago. So that's our, our first sustainability ac accelerator. And we've added another one here in Wisconsin since then. But um, we really think that's um, an industry that 
it's important that more investment is made into solutions uh, when it comes to the environment. Um, and it's been really cool to see some of the really innovative ideas coming out of that program. So that's uh, right there in Chicago. Depending on how the mayoral race goes, um, you know, there's been at least one candidate that's, you know, kind of base their platform on more investment in, you know, communities, right? So maybe that maybe there's more opportunity there. We'll see how that goes, right? I'm originally from Chicago or from the suburbs, and I admit I had not been following the mayoral race as closely until this week. And I was like, wow. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> well, I have a lot I'm, going I've on got up my there popcorn. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've got the, you've got the, the, the big uh, Supreme Court uh, battle up, up yeah. there. So uh, that's yeah, what I've been focused on. Yep. I, I love what you guys are doing. I, I think that what you're bringing, you know, to underserved communities, I love the fact that you're focusing on companies that are growing outside of Silicon Valley. What a novel concept, right? <laughs> right. Um, I just love the fact that you're, you're, you're enabling these companies. You're, you're, you're doing what the, th the work that it takes to make them successful. And I think that's uh, just really awesome. I love the fact that you're a B Corp too. Um, so Thank you so much for coming on and telling us about Generator. Of course. Uh, Thanks for having me. Super exciting. Oh, well, thank you for being on. And we look forward to seeing where you guys go next. All right. We'll keep you posted on our progress. Thanks for watching. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And if you could, please give us a like and hit that subscribe button. That subscribe button really helps the channel enormously. And I would so much appreciate it if you clicked on that. And I will see you in the next one.